Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the TechSRX Medication for Substance Use Disorders ECHO. We're very happy to see you here. My name is Andrea Hebler, and I will be your facilitator during this session. Before we start, let me please ask you if you could go to the bottom of your screens and make sure that you click that mute button. We want to make sure that our speakers can present without any background noises or interruptions. So please, let's keep ourselves muted, unless, of course, we want to talk. Um, these sessions are being recorded for later distribution. However, the information that you see on the chat is not being recorded. So please feel free to start adding your names, organizations, affiliations, credentials. This information will be used actually to uh, confirm your attendance to this class, especially if you're seeking CMEs and, and credits. Thank you for doing that. I see many of you are already adding your credentials. There is a post-session survey link as usual. It only takes maybe less than three minutes. And when you do it, when you complete that survey, you will qualify for a $30 gift card. So that's another reason to complete our survey. Of course, no, not public health information is allowed in this session. That means any information that can give any cues about the person that we are discussing, whether it's phone numbers, addresses, or things of that nature. We're all professional and we all know that, but we always have to remind ourselves about that. And we want to thank our two presenters of the day. We have Joyce Subring and Lisa Grisham. They are from Banner Medical and they are presenting on care of women with substance use disorders during and after pregnancy. We're very happy and we're very thankful for them to give us their time to present on this important topic in this session. Before we start with the presentation, very briefly, we're going to introduce our hub experts. Dr. Walker, could you introduce yourself to the team, please? Absolutely. Good afternoon, everybody. Crystal Walker, PA by training with a doctorate. I am the Director of Substance Use Disorders Medical Services for My Health, My Resources of Tarrant County. Very, very long mouthful there. Um, I'm in Fort Worth, Texas, and happy to be here. Thank you. Dr. King. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Van King. I'm a addiction psychiatrist and the uh, medical director of Be Well, Texas here in San Antonio. Glad to see everybody. Thank you. Is Dr. Waplu in the session yet? Or Dr. Kowalczyk? Oh, Dr. Kowalczyk, go ahead and introduce yourself, please. Thank you. Sure. Um, I'm Alicia, Dr. Kowalczyk. I'm an associate professor at Baylor College of Medicine, and I'm medical director of Santa Maria Hostel, and I'm boarded in family and addiction medicine. Thank you. Dr. Waplu. Hi, uh, Siddharth Waklu. I'm an addiction psychiatrist by training and faculty at UD Southwestern. I'm the director for the addiction psychiatry services here and the addiction psychiatry fellowship director. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Waklu. And Julie. Hi, everyone. Julie Parrish. I'm the um, ECHO program manager here at the Center for Substance Use and Telementoring. Um, I'm also a rehab counselor by training. Glad to see everyone. Thank you, Julie. So I think we're ready to start with our didactics. Uh, Joyce and Lisa, whenever you're ready, we can start sharing your slides. Great. All right, give me one second. One, two, share. And I hear a little noise in the background. If that person could please mute himself or herself during the presentation, that would be great. Thank you. Can I just get confirmation that you can see my screen? Yes, we okay. see it. Great. And you can take it away, thanks. Okay. Well, thank you all for being, uh, for letting us be here today. Happy to be here to share this special work that we do with our OB um, patients. And I'm just really proud of the work and just happy to 
meet some of our healthcare providers all over. Uh, so I am um, Joy Subrin, and I'm the OBGYN social worker. I'm embedded in the OB practice. I'm also a doctor in behavioral health, and we're here to share with you um, creating a paradigm shift in caring for substance use disorder during and after pregnancy with my wonderful colleague Lisa Grisham and NPBC, who will be presenting the second half of our presentation. I've been doing this for years and we're not advancing. There we go. Our learning objectives are to discuss stigma of substance use disorder in pregnancy, the scope of the problem, describe care for women with substance use disorder during pregnancy and following delivery, and how a care bundle can impact uh, mom and baby diet and improve outcomes. So Banner UMC OBGYN clinic has a special clinic called Moms, and it's the bridge between outpatient prenatal care and inpatient. It's an evidence-based care model uh, for the maternal infant dyad that is affected by opioid use disorder. And it demonstrates our unwavering dedication and compassion. Substance use disorder in pregnancy, uh, just to address a few thoughts uh, and frequently asked questions about what and why. And judging by our audience today, you may know some of this information, but why um, pain emotional and physical family of origin culture emotional numbing partner influence energy acceptance friend culture and some other thoughts joy i'm mm -hmm. sorry to interrupt for a second maybe that noise could that be your microphone that it's too sensitive probably we hear like a like a noise in the background that is interrupting your uh oh uh, is, do you have a microphone somewhere that you're touching or something like that no i don't i'm just using my laptop oh okay then uh -oh. someone else someone else is making noises and is currently joy i think it's every time session. your lap every time your laptop moves we get a little like bouncing and stuff i don't know oh so i won't touch yeah it's perfect won't right touch there. the table is that better Yes. yes, I oh. think that's better. Thank you. Sorry, everybody. Thank you. For no problem. <laughs> no problem. You can continue. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, so use of alcohol, tobacco, drugs and during pregnancy is the leading preventable cause of mental, physical, and psychological impairment in children. Oh, the only time I'll have to touch is my advancement. Uh, perinatal that affects women of all races, ethnicities, and social economic levels. Um, higher rate of unintended pregnancy because only women may not um, even know they're pregnant. So sorry, I'm glad we all are hanging with me with that little bit of sound interruption. The scope of the problem, this is a very large slide. These, this addresses some of the data from 2017 to 2021. Um, and the most updated numbers are in black below. So this just is to display the jump in the numbers of, of substance use disorder. You can see it just escalating over the years. And this second data indicates the verified non-fatal opioid overdose events um, in 2023. So just want to show you these are non-fatal opioid overdoses, but again, you can see the escalation of this problem. And the, the mom's clinic, which is in our OB office, and the Family Centered NAS Care Program uh, were built in response to this growing population. Just a short slide about Narcan, and I, I think Narcan um, is why we saw some of those numbers in our last slide in terms of people surviving. So I just always like to share how to how to get your hands on Narcan for clients and patients. It all starts in the beginning. So this is where I come in as the OB social worker, um, addressing women who are struggling with substance use disorder uh, that are currently um, in an MAT program or they want help enrolling. Um, constantly coordinating with rehab facilities that provide treatment to women, just looking for women and reaching out from having reach out from women who just need help filling the gap. And of course, uh, women who are actively using or pursuing um, hazard, with, with hazardous consequences. 
And the goal of our collaboration approach is to treat the whole person rather than the single problem. We emphasize the interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary of resource sharing. Uh, the patient is viewed as an equal partner in her own care. Uh, quality patient care depends on the team rather than when relying on one single person and meeting the goals of the quadruple aim. And many of you might be familiar with the IHI's 2007 three pronged approach called the triple aim of healthcare to improve patient experience, improve health population or population health, reduce per capita costs. And then there was another aim added to make it the quadruple aim, which is um, attaining joy in our work and improving uh, team well being. And I can say without a shadow of a doubt that this program has benefited my role. And um, it's just one of the most meaningful parts of my job. Again, this is just a short slide on how we talk to patients for probably teaching of others. Um, keep patient as the primary focus, access what the woman values most, encourage the woman to identify how their own behaviors um, have impact on things that they care about, uh, help identify small changes that the woman can make, and assist her in generating a plan. And this is definitely something this group is aware of, but this is the evidence based um, model that I use is motivational interviewing skills and. Um, the ACOG recommends also to use evidence based screening tools when evaluating women, and these are the three they suggest the four keys, the night and the craft. And just to reiterate, you know, the reason that we use collaborative care is. So that our moms can learn from each other, that multidisciplinary teams can affect one another and, and have optimal outcomes. Um, we want to unite women during a sensitive time of their life. We want to help women learn about positive coping techniques. And we want to help women during pregnancy to connect with all of the services that can ultimately improve outcomes. And I like to say that it is the, about providing the right intervention at the right time. Um, if anyone is thinking about creating a group in your practice, these are some of the topics that we utilize uh, with our patients um, in the group format to talk about um, mindfulness and exercise and self care, safe sleep, myths and realities about MAT, um, sleep hygiene healthy relationships. So in our group format, we want our patients to have an opportunity to learn about these topics and how they coincide with self care and improving outcomes. And this is just um, sort of a model to show sort of the continuum of care and the five points of intervention. So from meeting a patient pre pregnancy to the prenatal care, we want to promote awareness of the effects of MAT and then we want to talk to the patient once they're getting closer to birth and at birth um, postnatally and then in early childhood so we just really look at this woman um, in the stages of her of her next step um, not just at one point but at many And this is something that I think all of us in this room agree to and agree upon that our job as health care providers is not only to provide care, but to improve it. And so being part of the mom's clinic, which is a culture of acceptance um, and, and support, and then leading to the family centered NAS care program in our NICU, that is an improvement to care where we have seen um, positive outcomes for mom and baby. And I'm going to turn it over to Lisa to talk about the positive outcomes of our prenatal care program. Thanks, Joy. Thank um, so our program we call the Family Centered NAS Care Program. And what we do is we utilize the Eat, Sleep, and Console model, which some of you may be familiar with. Next slide. So neonatal abstinence syndrome or neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome is when an infant or a fetus is exposed to opioids in utero, and then they're born, that umbilical cord is cut, and they no longer have access to those opioids. They have these chronically stimulated mu receptors that then creates a cascade of neurotransmitters, and I'm going to go through that in a little more detail on the next slide. 
um, but it's experiencing the withdrawal symptoms from not having access to those opioids. So when we say NAS is actually when they have withdrawal symptoms. Not all babies um, that are exposed to opioids will go on to develop withdrawal. The estimates are between 60 and 80%, depending on the literature you look at. And I tend to still call it NAS or neonatal abstinence syndrome because we have so much polysubstance use. And there are other medications such as benzodiazepines, the SSRIs, many of your antidepressants, um, especially tobacco that can cause or exacerbate withdrawal symptoms. So you'll hear me continue to call it NAS throughout this presentation. The newer term is neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome, and that's specific to opioid withdrawal only. Um, so they're kind of they are kind of used interchangeably. So I just wanted to address that. Next slide. This is a, a picture from the Agency for Health and Research and Quality. Um, it, it, if you're not familiar, this is available and I put the link there in the bottom. It's an interactive map of the United States and the incidence of neonatal abstinence syndrome. So you can see here, um, Texas is, is kind of in the lower color range, the, the less than 3.3, and Arizona's in closer to the higher end um, with an incidence of 10.3 cases per um, 1,000 newborn hospitalizations. The overall national rate, the national average is 6.3. Now the caveat to this graph is that the numbers are only as good as the state's reporting system. So you guys may look at this and be like, what, we only have you know, a, a very low number in Texas. That's not true. That's not what we're seeing. And it may be that we're just still working on the reporting structure, but at least this gives us a start as to the incidence of infants that are experiencing NAS across the United States. Next slide. So the physiology, I kind of referred to that. It's basically you have a cascade of neurotransmitters. Um, you're, and then you get an increase in your cyclic AMP, your protein kinase, and all these transcription factors that oh. kick out a, a, a different regulation. So we have a decrease in our serotonin, which causes um, sleep deprivation and sleep fragmentation. We also have a decrease in our dopamine, which causes contributes to hyper irritability. And in adult um, cases, they report anxiety. And then we get an increase in the other transmitters, the neuroadrenaline, which is your hyperthermia, hypertension, tremors. These babies will have bad, bad tremors in some cases and tachycardia. You get an increase in your corticotrophin. So that's your cortisol, your stress response. So it's increased stress and hyperphagia. And then you get also an increase in your acetylcholine. So that's a lot of your autonomic type symptoms and gastrointestinal, diarrhea, vomiting, yawning, sneezing, and sweating. And for yawning and sneezing, these babies will not yawn repetitively, you know, six or 10 times in a row. Um, and when we see the babies do this, it's not uncommon to have the mom go, oh, that happens to me too. I experience that as well. So it is very, very... Um, the sim symptoms are very similar in infants as compared to moms um, and adults. Next slide. So the way we currently diagnose NAS is we use this modified Finnegan scoring system. Most of the country uses that. Uh, it's a majority of the, the places across the country are using it. And when you get above a certain threshold, so three consecutive scores of eight or two 12s or the average, then that's kind of your, your indication that the baby needs to go to a higher level of care and we start medication on them, scheduled medication every three hours until we get those scores under that threshold, eight or less. Uh, next slide. I've got a couple images of the Finnegan uh, scale, and it's broken down into central nervous symptoms. So you'll see sleeping, tremors are on this, increased muscle tone is another big one we see. Next slide is your autonomic symptoms. So your hyperthermia, modeling, that's the lace-like color of their skin is kind of a circulatory um, dysregulation. It doesn't cause any, any problems. It's just one of the symptoms we notice, your respiratory rate. And then on your gastrointestinal symptoms, these infants can be very discoordinated with their withdrawal. They can have excessive sucking. They can have frequent vomiting. And we know many babies spit up, but this is this is a lot of spitting up and, and even projectile in nature. And then some diarrhea and loose stools. So you add all of these things together. And if you get above that eight, that's kind of your indication that the baby is having moderate withdrawal and you need to support the baby in some manner. 
So um, what we've done for the last 40 years since this scale was developed in 1975 is we start the baby on some medication. Many places are using morphine either every three hours or every four hours. Both of those are okay with the, with the timing and the half-life. Um, three hours corresponds generally with babies will eat every three hours. And so it's a little easier to give that way. Some places are using methadone because it's a longer acting, longer half-life. So you don't have to dose as frequently. And then in addition, we're using some adjunct therapy such as clonidine and phenobarbital. There are some newer studies that are coming out with giving the babies buprenorphine, especially when the moms take that for their substance use disorder. And it has promising results. The, the tricky part about the buprenorphine is that um, it the oral solution comes um, in a form with some alcohol in it as part of the elixir. And you, we don't wanna give infants that. So we have to find a solution that doesn't have that. And then the big, the big change that you're seeing sweep across the country, and I know a lot of places in Texas are doing this, is called Eat, Sleep, and Console. And it's where we really, it's, it's kind of a bundle, but we really emphasize that the parents are part of the treatment. So next slide. Eat, Sleep, and Console was developed between Dr. Grossman and his team at Yale uh, between 2010 and 2016. And it, it essentially is you're taking the Finnegan scoring assessment out of the picture and you're bringing in Eat, Sleep, and Console as an assessment piece. So you look at can the baby eat at least an, a normal amount and it's, it's loosely defined as one ounce per feed or breastfeeding well. We all know that babies who are one day old frequently will not take an ounce, maybe 10 cc's on day one, 20 cc's on day two, 30 cc's or an ounce up by day three of life per feeding. So you have to adjust that for the, for the infant. Um, do they sleep for at least an hour without their withdrawal symptoms, disturbing them and waking them up? And can you console them within 10 minutes when after they're fed, after they have a clean diaper, but they are just so fussy because of their withdrawal symptoms, are you able to console them in a reasonable amount of time? And he put 10 minutes on that time frame. So like I mentioned, Eat, Sleep, and Console really refers to the assessment piece of it. And it's part of a bundle where you're standardizing, emphasizing non-pharmacologic care. You're getting in touch with these moms ahead of time, doing prenatal counseling and really sending that message. I want you there. I want you part of your baby's treatment, which mothers have reported that that's very empowering to them. The, and then it's, instead of just committing a baby to scheduled morphine where you have to wean them slowly 10 to 20% every one to two days and they end up in the hospital for weeks, sometimes months, we're changing to let's just give morphine if the baby can't eat, can't sleep, or can't be consoled. We just give them that one time, kind of reset them, and then move on. We don't commit them to a long course. So one of the consoling interventions that we like to teach these families comes from Dr. Harvey Karp and the Happiest Baby on the Block. It's the five S's of soothing. Um, he's got a book on it. He's got a video. And it's it's just really concrete things. It wasn't designed for infants with neonatal abstinence syndrome. It was designed for all newborns, but it works really well for these infants. So we use a lot of swaddling, the side lying while you're holding them, um, shushing, swinging, swaying, and sucking. Uh, if you if you Google this, you can find a video for eight ninety five that I think I've shown to a thousand moms um, and parents, and it's just a really easy tool to show them how to do these five things. I like to include this picture from the Robert Wood Johnson because the the top picture, the equality, is what we've done for the last forty years. We have a program. You got to fit into our program, and this is how it works. And you know, I'm sorry if you don't have transportation or if you have other kids to take care of, but your baby's going to be here in the hospital, and they only do better if you can be here. Whereas the equity is what we do now: is we really meet with these families. Joy starts that process in clinic and figures out what are going to be your barriers to staying with the baby. What can we do? How can we help you? And we really tailor the program for each of the families to make it work best for them and best for the baby. Substance use disorder. I, I was looking a lot of the titles on um, the participant list. And I think you guys, you guys already know this. I don't need to, to drone this into you and stuff. But what I do want to say is just just talk to them. I still see this in the hospital on a daily basis that people are so afraid to ask them about their substance use because it's they're just nervous. It's something they're not used to and not comfortable. And if you just come in like, oh, okay, I see you're on this. Let's talk about this, you know, when your history and stuff, and you just make it comfortable, it can be very comfortable. Um, so just don't don't hesitate to talk to them. 
Um, some of the outcomes real quick, our length of stay dropped significantly um, for our infants with NAS. The blue graphs there, the average length of stay was six, six and a half days between 2017 when we started and 2020. Um, and I apologize, I need to get you some updated graphs, but the numbers are still the same for those family centered, maybe up to seven days now. Um, our average length of stay just by changing our culture, for, we still treat infants pharmacologically if the parents aren't able to be there and stay present, but just by holding the babies more and changing the way we view it, we decreased our length of stay significantly. Um, however, COVID hit and we bumped up a little bit because we had less, you know, less participants, less families in there helping hold the babies, but um, we're still doing good with them. And then the morphine, I think, was the exciting piece. Back in 2015, we were giving an average of 173 doses of morphine to an infant with NAS treated in our NICU. And by kind of really, you know, looking at does the baby need it, do some standardized training, we got it down to 86 doses of morphine for those infants on scheduled pharmacologic treatment. Um, for the infants in the family-centered care using eight, sleep, and console, it's less than one dose of infant per yeah, dose of morphine per infant on average. So that's some great turnouts. Um, so that is kind of what Joy and I wanted to, to present, and then we'll move on to the case um, presentation next. Thank you, ladies. Thank you for that presentation. Um, do we have questions, comments from our learners or from our hub? Regarding that graph where you show different states with the different numbers, are there any factors that contribute to that difference there in are, those I mean, numbers? Yeah, there's, I think, as you guys know, there's a lot of hot spots across the country. Um, it started with Ohio. West Virginia has a very high incidence of, of uh, opioid use disorder. And, and that translates to the infants and stuff. I think West Virginia is the highest across the United States. So there are things like that. A lot of the border, Southern, you know, close to Mexico, we, we tend to have higher numbers. So when I saw this graph and I saw Texas was low on this chart, it, it kind of was surprising to me because that's not generally what I hear when I talk to people from, you know, that work within Texas. Um, but I think a lot of it is is the reporting structure. Different states have different requirements for reporting and whether we're really capturing the numbers accurately. And I try and, you know, I'm, I'm in school for research right now and I try and promote research. We need to do a better job quantifying these numbers so we can get the resources to um, the people who need them. Thank you. I just want to say thank you guys for the presentation. It was really informative and I really thought that the content was very useful for our community here. So I do have a question and this is targeting some of the stigma that you guys were talking about surrounding this. So the biggest issue that I encounter with my individuals that are pregnant and on buprenorphine is the fear of when it comes time for the birthing process about CPS being involved and is the hospital going to call CPS and am I going to get in trouble for being on buprenorphine? So how do you guys navigate that? Or do you have any advice for us to tell our patients how to navigate that in a hospital system that may not have such an amazing program like you guys have access to? Lisa, can I start? <laughs> yes. We both have thoughts about this. Thank you, Dr. Walker. That is a great question. And one that before this program um, five years ago, it was just sink tank my heart, you know, because I didn't want that patient to get sidelined or what's the term um, anyway. So uh, T-boned, I'm not sure. So it's important to recognize that we have medical knowledge and we have knowledge of the steps. And we should do just like we do with any other chronic condition, help the patient understand the next steps. So that's how I phrase it. I have the luxury of meeting with patients antepartum and building some rapport. But even if I have to meet them one time before they're going to deliver, that's kind of how I phrase it. This is just like any other next step in medicine, chronic condition. This is what the next steps are. I'd like to share this with you so you have opportunity to be prepared emotionally. Um, I'll tease in words like, I care about your mental health um, and you handling this 
and you having every opportunity to to prepare. Um, I'll also tell them. I hope that was expressed, <laughs> answered your question. I'll also tell them that them participating in prenatal care, even if it's one, two, or hopefully more visits, that that is. Um, I hate to use the word facts or evidence, but showing some evidence of moving steps forward that um, when DCS is called, that's what we call in our state, DCS, Department of Child Services, it might be CPS in other states, um, that you can offer um, a release of information for any record. You know, if you're enrolled in MAT care, we can help to get documents prepared for that interview. Um, so it's just helping helping them realize that all of their steps will go towards the final outcome. I also tell them that DCS reports will include strengths and risks. Um, again, identifying that that woman has strengths and her family has strengths. Sorry, I've gone off on a tangent. But to answer your question, um, yes, I think out of respect for the next stages to just communicate it that way, that there will be some next steps. Can we talk about them? Is this on your mind? <laughs> Any I think, yeah, so Joy starts the discussion with them when she meets with them. And it's not like if they will be called because we just present it as they're going to be called. This is how it is. This is the law. And, you know, if it happens to be that that there's not a call made for for whatever reason, there is there is some leeway for if you have somebody that's been in treatment for years, then you don't necessarily have to make a call. But we don't want to get into picking who does that or not. So we just present it. It's going to be a call. This is what it's going to look like. This is how we're going to handle it. These are the things that you're going to do. And if we have a family that is having trouble with, um, you know, recent sobriety or, or something, and then it's like, okay, this is what they're going to ask. They're going to be asking for a responsible adult. Do you have someone in your life that can be that responsible adult? This is the definition of a responsible adult. And we prepare them for that. Um, additionally, what I did when we started this, I, I didn't always understand um, what the families were telling me or maybe necessarily even believe them. And then I witnessed some of the stories that, you know, firsthand with these families, um, children taken away because of false positive toxicology results. Um, and, and I've seen, you know, them come in, DCS workers come in and say, well, this, your baby's this way because you did this, you took meth, you know, sort of thing. And I'm like, that's, that's not accurate. Mm -hmm. They got phenylephrine in the C-section and that's why the methamphetamine result is coming back. It's not, you wait, you know, it'll be negative and sure enough it is. So we, I went through writing a memorandum. You, first of all, you need a champion in the hospital. So find that person. Then we wrote, went through writing a memorandum of understanding and we got a contract to have a DCS liaison on site. So we started partnering with them. They knew us, we knew them. They knew that I wasn't just trying to get babies to go home with you know, my friends and stuff. I was really looking at all the situations and we were trying to improve the care and get decisions made sooner. Cause that is the other thing. The caseload for DCS workers is you know, a mile long. And so they don't prioritize looking at this until the day of discharge, which kills me. You, know, you can't let a family think that they're gonna take their baby home and then at the 11th hour pull that baby. So a lot of meetings with them and having them on site um, has been instrumental in improving the situation. Um, we also got work cell phones that I give all my families the work cell phone number. So I tell them, if you run into difficulty with a DCS worker, I want to know about it and I want to help you navigate that and kind of, you know, give them that backup that they need. And it doesn't happen often, but sometimes, um, yeah, I've, I've witnessed DCS workers be downright not all of them, just some, some rare situations where, yeah, exactly what you're talking about. And there is a comment in the chat that says, I had a case where CPS took the baby away from the client, claiming that she had neglected the baby by being on methadone while so pregnant. That is one of the other things in the state of Arizona that it either the claim, as soon as the call goes in, it's called abuse or neglect. And, and so all of these cases go under neglect. And so I also try and educate families. They're going to call it neglect. You are doing anything but neglecting your baby. You are following physician's orders. You are doing this. I don't like the way this works, but this is what it is. This is how we're going to handle it. And just preparing them so they hear that ahead of time and not the first time that caseworker comes in and tells them like, well, I'm here because it's a report of neglect. Like, oh, and then taking them away. That's just... Yeah, that, I'm so glad you said that, Lisa. It is all about reviewing the terminology used 
with your with your patient. We hear it every day, right? But they don't, and we want to soften that landing as much as we can. Um, those those are excellent, excellent points. Do you have this script, talking point questions that they're going to be asked, written out? You, I know you mentioned an MOU that you have. If you have anything like that that you could share with our learning network, that would be unbelievably appreciated. Yeah, let me check. I, I think I can share that. Um, it, I probably would take out our names and stuff, but yeah, I think yeah. that would be. Um, and the script is just something that I think I've developed over over years. I do know we have, I see a couple of hands up, but we have in Arizona, we have Hushabai Nursery. They actually have a script and they have the mother's call and self-report during pregnancy and get that that unborn case documented. And it shows them being accountable and taking action with the child welfare services. So I could probably get a copy of that. Uh, I'll ask for permission to share it with you as well. I just, um, Lindsay's, oh, sorry. Lindsay's had her hand up for a while. I was oh, just sorry. Um, so I'm one of those parents. <laughs> I went into my doctor and when I got pregnant, right, I was on meth before that. I told my doctor I had done it, but I quit when I found out I was pregnant. I was drug tested weekly, never failed. I went into the hospital and they tested me and told me that I tested positive for tricyclics, but my baby did not. And they took him away from C CPS came and took him away. Like in that 11th hour, right? Stresses me out. And we it have, was, so it was we horrible. had. <laughs> we had a situation with a mom that Joy had been following at clinic. She came in and she said, all I want to do is breastfeed. And I said, they're going to tell you, you can't breastfeed. Somebody's going to tell you at some point, you know, you call me and I'll get on the phone with them. Well, she called me at 5 a.m. after delivering her baby, you know, at 4 a.m. And she said, they told me I can't. And she had a false positive fentanyl result. She gave the urine before she even got an epidural. And I knew this mom. I knew her through joy. We had been meeting with her, like we established that relationship. So I went through talking to everybody in the hospital, like, please, can we please let her breastfeed? I'm going to call her center where she gets her, her methadone from. I got 68 pages of copies of negative tox screens and faxed them and scanned them into our medical record. And I talked to all the providers and they all thought I was, you know, I had lost my mind that I was letting this mom breastfeed. And then on, on day four, we got the urine back, the conference that it was negative. It was, it was a false positive and stuff. And it's, it happens all the time. And I, I, that mom, I was able to speak for because the relationship we had developed starting with joy, but it, all of these moms, including you, like it, it kills me. It happened. You know. What I can tell you though, is that my next baby, cause I got pregnant again, I didn't go to the doctor. I just didn't get services and I didn't get prenatal care. And I, when I went to the hospital, I refused yeah. all testing on her because I wouldn't, I was scared. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. Is understandably. Understandably. Of yeah. course. And, and this is such that's why we're here. We want to break that mold and yeah. help. Wonderful. Thank you for the work you're doing, uh, Joyce and Lisa. That's this has been a great and I know there are more of our learners who would like to ask questions and participate, but no worries because our case presentation again with Joy and Lisa is going to complement this didactic. So this discussion will continue. So for now, we're going to move to announcements very quickly, and then we come back to the conversation, if that is okay with everybody. And the Center for Substance Use Training and Telementoring by Be Well Texas is a program that uh, provides high quality behavioral and care in general for substance use disorders everywhere in Texas. We currently have six different series and each one of them addresses a different area of substance use disorder care. If you want more information about CSTAT, please go to our page. That is cstat.uthealthsanantonio.edu. Next, please. And remember, it's very easy to claim CME credits for this class. All you have to do is send via text of the code 100-94667, and you should be receiving your certificate of attendance via phone with no problem. Thank you. Next. And this is very exciting. This is our new series. It's the Behavioral Health Echo Series. That is Friday, 
September 29 at 12. This series is directed specifically to behavioral health professionals who would like to train more on screening, uh, assessing, and referring patients who are affected by substance use disorders. It's going to be great. And again, that's Friday, September the 29th. We're dropping the link right now in the chat. Please register. We would love to see you there. Next. And their recovery science, ECA, of course, that's our second new series. That's Wednesday, October the 18th. And this is a session more directed to recovery scientists and researchers who maybe want to address knowledge gaps in peer support services research. So it's going to be a very interesting and very special series. Please join us on October 18 at 12 p.m. next. And of course, next week, like always here at TechSRX, that's the third Tuesday of every month, Dr. Hugo will be talking about alcohol use disorders. Thank you. And now I think we can move to the second part of this conversation, and that will be the case whenever Joy and Lisa are ready. Sure. It looks like you're there. It is. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. I can see it. So um, we wanted, we could have picked so many patients um, who have touched our lives and have um, been clinically challenging or, or challenging in one way or another. So this is one patient that we picked um, to share with you today because she had some unique challenges. Um, so I haven't used this form before, so I'm going to do my best. So this was a patient um, who presented at Banner UMC Tucson. She is 38 years old, female, um, private commercial insurance. And what we all consider today as a group is help with non-medication treatment. And you'll see why I identified that with my um, two questions. So questions I'd like to kind of have on the top of our mind is strategies to improve the worth for patients their self-worth, sorry, it's really small on my end, um, who feel judged um, by society as a pregnant woman utilizing medication-assisted treatment for opioid disorders. So that's my one thing I'd like this group to be thinking about. And the other is strategies to reduce vaping during pregnancy. Um, so this patient, again, 38 years old, pregnant, um, using MAT and also nicotine, um, as you can see, I've checked present there and has a history of heroin abuse in 2019 and has been on uh, an MAT treatment since that time successfully. Um, thank you for scrolling. Um, I'll go straight to the mental health status. So a diagnosis of depression and is controlled um, by medication. Um, no mania, uh, anxiety, controlled with Lexapro and PRN, hydroxyzine medication, no psychosis, other symptoms are insomnia, um, controlled with tragedone. And so her two substances that I've listed here, opioids and nicotine. So one is um, controlled with the use of MAT. So I've hit no for um, all of those but we are still helping this patient uh, with vaping and use of nicotine. So it is something that she's concerned about. She was actually not forthcoming with her husband about continuing uh, nicotine use. Um, relevant medications are listed here, Suboxone, Lexapro, Trazodone, Buprenorphine, Buprenorphine. So medical comorbidities, she is pregnant, like I mentioned, um, insomnia, anxiety, and I did forget to list depression. I listed it before. Um, so some of the proposed treatment plan for this patient was to um, have the con patient continue with her MIT clinic. Um, an issue that we faced early on was that with commercial insurance, she was informed out uh, after after being there since I think I said 2017 or 2019, all of a sudden the prices were doubling. So that was her first concern for me was how do I stay stable on my medication during pregnancy when I cannot afford the double the price. 
Um, so that was our first treatment uh, plan was to figure out an option that was more affordable so she could stay stable. Um, so that was the second one was patient will report depression or anxious mood. So we want to continue to track those. Patient will practice smoking cessation activities and access to patient support. A little hard to do. And again, she was, of course, coming with the, her partner. But we're going to, that's something on our minds during this group talk today, how we can make that work for the patient. Um, patient will participate in the one to one NICU consult with Lisa or her team. So again, she can prepare for that NICU stay and have an idea of what the eat sleep control model looks like and the happiest baby um, techniques. So we'll put that on our plan during her prenatal care. Patient will participate in parent education classes prior to delivery. Um, these were our shared goals, just so you know, these are agreed upon with the patient. Um, patient will participate in self care and nurturing techniques during times of transition and increased stress. Just like I said, we need strategies to help her feel her self worth and um, value herself since she heavily feels the stigma um, of being a woman on MAT during pregnancy. So, this was just one of our cases, maybe familiar to others in the room. Um, and maybe you face some of these same scenarios. And anything successful or we would like to discuss with the state, we're open to it. Okay, so we're open the floor now for questions about the case, suggestions from our hub as well. Any so uh, how how far along in the in the pregnancy is this lady? We met her um, for the first time. She was getting prenatal care, but didn't have an identified need because she was moving along in her MAT and she already had a behavioral health provider. But I met her, I believe, somewhere around 20 weeks when she realized she had to find a new MAT provider. She subsequently has delivered um, between now and our presentation. But we met her around 20 weeks. And so what what was the, uh, I guess one of the things you were talking about is uh, trying to help her with her uh, baby. She, she wanted to cut down on that? She did. And she would still like to cut down now in the postpartum period with breastfeeding. Um, so what, what was it that she was doing to try to cut down? And I mean, was she you know, getting any specific, you know, um, counseling of these CBT or anything? I mean, what, what, what kind of intervention was she getting? She um, was just continuing on with CBT, but I'm not sure she was honest about her vaping even with her therapist. Um, that's why it was just really delicate. I tried to introduce the idea of the app because that could be done on personal time. And it was kind of just very stigmatized between her and her partner that she didn't want him to know that she was vaping. So I can say that she was engaged in CBT. I don't really know if she would engage, I'm sorry, would she disclose that with her therapist? And so I went the route of what can she do on her own personal digital phone? There's an app for smoking and vaping cessation. That's what I. Oh, so she didn't. I mean, how often was she seeing the therapist? Uh, if I think I might have noted this, I think it was every two weeks. This was at at her MAT program, or where was this? Therapy? No, she had a behavioral health home separate from ours. So it's a little challenging when we don't share medical records because I can't follow those notes. Well, it seems like it's it's her. Was she living with her partner? Yeah. So I, I'm guessing that she was having to live with her nicotine use. <laughs> 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 At least in part from that, right? Yeah, yeah. The way I tried to approach it also was about destigmatizing that you know your partner and the rest of the world. Um, faces these challenges, you're no, you're no different. We want to help you and harboring a secret really um, has to increase the stress around it. So that was my personal technique was 
trying to kind of have her shift from thinking that this is shameful and he's not going to understand to let's involve him in your treatment. I don't know, would the, would the crowd, would the audience agree that that would be helpful? Would have been helpful. Yeah. Well, I, I noticed she was on Bipropion, which can actually help some people with their craving for nicotine. And, um, you, you know, she, I mean, it's, they usually have people take a higher dose than 150. So I guess that's something she could have addressed with, you know, whoever was prescribing her Bipropion if she was telling them, you know, about her nicotine problem. Okay. I'm glad you brought up that point. I, I would feel confident knowing that she did speak to her MAT provider, which again is separate location from her behavioral health provider. Um, and maybe they did up her dose in relationship to how that may affect her smoking and craving, her vaping and craving. So that's wise to, I could have shared that with her um, or not in future patients. But to please be open at least with your MAT provider because it could benefit, your dose could increase the benefit. Your That's one of the things we've tried to establish is a monthly meeting with three of the, the biggest MAT providers in the city. And um, as long as we get a release of information, we could we can bring stuff like that up at these meetings to like, hey, this, you know, this patient is she's gotten her her medication doses secured now. We've we fixed that problem, but she's still struggling with that. And I I don't know, um, I don't think we had her ROI for whatever reason, um, we weren't able to do that. Yeah. She did, when she presented, normally like the first time they present, especially when it's around 20 weeks, Joy will give them a little bite-sized piece of what to expect in the hospital. And then each time she'll kind of divvy out a little more of the information. And in this case, it was it was a crisis about figuring out where she was gonna get her medication. And so that took a couple of appointments, I think, to figure that out. Um, she did go on to to deliver. The baby did well. The baby had some transient tachypnea of the newborn and needed some respiratory support for about 24 hours. Um, mom also had diabetes. I think, we, I don't remember if we put that in there and stuff. And so uh, it was a very large baby that we had to do some extra imaging on, but everything turned out fine. And they went home in seven days with no doses of morphine for that infant. Um, and he's doing well, but it's um, the, the vaping thing was a big deal. And I remember even when I talked to her, they were like, do not bring this up in front of the, the partner. Yeah. And was she always vaping or does she transition from cigarettes to vaping? It's just curious about that. Um, I'd have to review that case note again. I, I, I know that when we met her, she had been vaping of course, let's just say a year or more. Oh, okay. she, I think, and I think it was more, she was doing a little bit of both, but it, but the, when she had this trouble getting her medication secured with the stress of that, I feel like it kicked it up the volume that she was doing. Um, and then she did cut out cigarette smokes, but, but kind of compensated with more vaping. So I wonder if she'd be receptive. I mean, the, the folks that I've had with, you know, nicotine use disorder that switch from cigarettes to vaping um, as a first step, then they just work on cutting back the concentration of nicotine, you know, yeah. uh, and they're able to ease off that way sometimes, um, sometimes. sometimes. So that might be another option in addition to going up on the low Oh, I appreciate that. And the other kind of comment I had was just, you know, um, you know, trying to address stigma and, um, you know, really throughout, you know, all the folks that she's encountering, you know, maybe reframing her medication therapy and, you know, to the newer terminology of mood and medication for opiate use disorder, not assisted treatment can be helpful. Um, I don't think that's her biggest source of stigma by any means, but I think just being consistent, you know, within her treatment community could be helpful and send a message as well. Absolutely. Um, and then I'm also wondering about, um, you know, her engagement with you know, the, the different groups in terms of, um, you know, in your program, did she come to some of the um, prenatal sessions where she can meet other folks that were on, um, on mood as well? Um, and how she found that, um, if you'll have peer, uh, peers in recovery um, that may have had experiences being on mood that um, are a little bit ahead of 
where she might be in terms of her recovery as a as a mom, right? Um, sounds like this is her first pregnancy being on mood. Um, Great points. Um, and I, I wish she would have attended our groups. Um, okay. Yeah, she didn't. It was a couple of barriers. Um, she's a, a working person and the group was during her work hours. And the other sense I got was just that, again, she wasn't there yet, ready to identify with anyone else. And I, hope, I think it led to a bit of isolation. Um, but no, she didn't attend. And she still has the opportunity. We continue to send invitations to our, our secure invitations to our patients for about a year after they deliver. Mm -hmm. So that's a hope of mine is that she'll turn up. Thank you, Joyce and Lisa, again. This has been a great discussion. And I know that some of you still have questions or comments. Please feel free to add those to the chat because we can address those via email. We'll find a way to communicate with you if there is something in particular. I know there have been some issues with CMEs. I'll address those after the session. You all will be sent an email with the correct um, text code so you can claim your credit. So no worries about that. Dr. King, in the interest of time, could you give us a brief summary and recommendations for the case? Thank you. You're muted, I think. <laughs> Cannot hear you. Yes. Um, one thing I wanted to mention that I I, I found there's been some other um, unusual uh, false positives, and one of them is risperidone and fentanyl. And it's not unusual for people to be on risperidone if they've got like a bipolar disorder or something like that. So I, I think that that's, that's something that I've seen here. Um, and also some false positives for naltrexone, uh, believe it or not, for, for uh, oxycodone. So I, I think that just emphasizes how a lot of this testing that's done you know, by CPS, criminal justice, they do not do um, uh, you know, uh, qu uh, quantitative or, or more sensitive testing, and they just act on it like it's true. And uh, there, there's many opportunities for things. You know, sertraline and, and benzodiazepine positives, for instance. So I, I, I think you're absolutely right about that. And, uh, you know, educating, you know, the folks that are doing this monitoring, it's sort of an ongoing process in some things. So our case was a uh, late 30s, uh, a, a woman that's pregnant uh, on, it sounds like, um, buprenorphine uh, treatment for, sounds like, several years, right? Uh, last time she had used any heroin was uh, in 2019, uh, was st stable in terms of her substance use problems, but continued to be distressed by uh, her, um, her uh, um, vaping uh, habit. Um, and it, it sounds like from our discussion that you know, part of, of, the, of the issue here was her ambivalence and her, um, her difficulties with trusting all of the people <laughs> in, her, um, in her therapeutic circle. It sounds like she had uh, a, a counselor uh, that she maybe wasn't talking with us about. Uh, uh, her uh, pregnancy uh, management team was aware. Um, it's it's also interesting that she felt like she was hiding this from her boyfriend, but people around folks that vape typically can tell that they're vaping, especially if they've done it reasonably, you know, because there's a smell that goes with it, right? So it, it's uh, it, it it seemed like she was continuing to use this vaping as one of her um, her coping mechanisms, and that uh, for whatever reason we're having a hard time sort of get, getting a hold of of well it, you know getting her to focus on that is something that uh, she could uh, that that she could perhaps uh, have some control over. 
um, because it seems like the way she was coping with um, with her vaping habit actually was adding to her anxiety and distress rather than really reducing it. Um, so uh, I think from my point of view, if there had been an opportunity to, uh, you know, perhaps, you know, coordinate some information with some of our other care providers, if she had allowed it, you know, perhaps she would have been able to make a little bit more progress on that. Um, but as it turns out, it seems like there was various barriers to her vaping very frequently. Maybe she was doing more at work or whatever, but certainly there's large portions of the day where she wouldn't have been able to, um, if, uh, you know, at least the times when she was around her, uh, her husband or her, uh, her partner. Um, but it sounds to me like she had a very good outcome, uh, even though she was, uh, Having some nicotine, uh, she didn't even need any medication for uh, uh, withdrawal in the baby, and uh, it sounds like things are. But you know, in terms of her ongoing care, it sounds like she really uh, potentially could benefit from uh, uh, group treatments or things where she could uh, actually interact with other people, and that might help her with her sense of stigma. So I guess we're a little bit over time here. Oh, you're uh, you're muted, uh, Andrea. Thank you so much. I was muted. Thank you so much to all of you for participating. We'll see you next month. Remember, it's the third Tuesday of every month. Thank you again. Remember to answer the closed session survey, and I will send an email to all the participants regarding the. Have a great afternoon. Bye bye.